أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So I wanted to make a video on how can غير علبات so other than علبات be على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. How is it possible for غير علبات to be على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم? Right? How is it possible for the people who are outside the family, outside the house of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, outside the zuriyat of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to be uh, ahle Muhammad, people of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Now, this is possible, but not in the way the traditional Sunnis explain it. So, who was ahle bayt Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and who were ahle Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? So, ahle bayt is a term that is really beautiful because the more philosophically you try to explain it, the more inescapable it becomes. And taking on for this particular matter, this particular mamla, the Salafi mizaj is actually pretty good. It what it means, but but not what the Salafi, so to speak, say. Not their opinion, but their mizaj. If truly taken on in this matter without prejudice, is the right one. So there's no other way to say Ahlebat other than Ahlebat. It's simple. There's the people of the household. So is Hazrat Khatija Ahlebat? Of course. Is Hassan Ahlebat? Of course. Is Hussein Ahlebat? Of course. Is Fatima Ahlebat? Of course. Is Ali Ahlebat? Of course. Is Zaid Ahlebat? Of course. Why? Because they all live in the house of who? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or at one point in their life, they lived in the house of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or their their ancestors. So is Osama Ibn Zaid? Alabat the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yes. Why? Because his father Zaid ibn Haratha is Alabat the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Do you understand? So people who lived in the house of Rasul or Um Aman, the mother of Osama ibn Zaid, is also Alabat the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam because Um Aman used to be the handmaiden or the slave girl of Amina, the mother mother of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and so she lived. She she's the one who after uh, the uh, mother Hazrat Amina passed away, she's the one who brought him back to Medina, and then she lived with him all, like all, as a wet nurse, but like as a second mother, you know. So the people who are who are literally living within the same physical structure as you that you call home are your ahlebat. Those are the ahlebat, and those are the people who have most qurb with you, and those are the people who have the most haq on you. Those are the people who have most qurb to your nafs, and those are the people who have most haq on your nafs. And there's of course tartib between them, but those are the people of the household who are living in the same physical structure. Now these archetypal relationships, both biological and socio-economical, that um, are, are included in alibat. So of course, brother, sister, father, mother, wife, child, son, daughter, grandfather, grandparent. Uncle, aunt, these are ahlebat the rasul. Uncle and aunt are usually not ahlebat, but because they were the ahlebat of your of your ahlebat, they're ahlebat by extension. You know, because at some point you and your father's brother lived in the same house. Now your father is your ahlebat, but his brother never stopped being. Uh, the ahlebat of your father, because at one point they lived in the same house, and so there's a broader idea of house, like the Game of Thrones type of house. So there's the people who are the immediate ahlebat, who are who are who have the most haq on you, who are actually currently living in the same physical structure as you. Those are the people who are ahlebat, and the people who who at one point lived in the same household as you are people who have secondary haq on you, the most haq, but after the ones who actually live. Now Now in the same physical structure. So yes, you, when your kids, your brother has the most huck on you because you don't have wife and children. But once you have wife and children, the wife and children have more huck on you than your brother. You know, so that's how it works. Um, so this is ahlebat. Now, of course, the zuriyat of the ahlebat, the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, are also ahlebat because you know they. Each generation is ahlebat with each other. Each like so, my mother or my father. Let's say my father. My father is my ahlebat. My father's father is his ahlebat. My great 
grandfather is the Ahlabat of my grandfather. My great great grandfather is the Ahlabat of my great grandfather. My great 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 grandfather is the Ahlabat of my great great grandfather. You know, so you see how it works. And so there's a chain of being Ahlabat back to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So that's how we, the Tasalsul, the Zuriyat of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, are Ahlabat of Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay. How can then غير زوريات So people who are not blood related to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam How can they be Ali Muhammad They can become Ali Muhammad when they archetypally take on the role of who? Um Ayman or Zaid ibn Haritha or Osama ibn Zaid or no, Zaid ibn Haritha etc. So let's take these two Osama ibn Zaid and Zaid ibn Haritha What does that mean? These are the slaves of the Asal ahl Muhammad. These are the slaves of the ahl bayt of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These are people who got to live in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They got to live in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam because they had a submissive power. They had that slave relationship, master slave relationship. So because that slave relationship is there, there's a power differential. But we are still ordered. They're still our brothers. They're still our sisters, and we still have to be kind to them. But they're directly under our hukum. And that being that being that power differential negates, you know, like a woman is naturally not attracted to her slave. She's attracted to someone with a higher social status than her. Now we're not talking about kinks and the and how society is weird, you know. Now we're not talking about that. But in a natural, naturally theomorphic, properly adal uh, ordered society, you know, a heavenly ordered society. That's how it is. So there's a negation of the desire of a woman toward her. Hazrat Yusuf is a is a huge exception, you know. But so they're in your house with the power differential, you know. She is the sayyida of the slave, right? The the woman is the sayyida of the slave. So women tend to be attracted to their sayyid, not attracted to the person whose sayyida she is, right? So. I wish I'd known that in college, you know. <laughs> that is, that would have been a great insight. I mean, everyone's on their own journey, but at least now I'm the sayyid, you know. Okay, moving on. Um, so what happens is when there's a power differential there, so they get to be part of the home. They're like family, and there's this role of power differential that enables this almost like adoptive family. It's not quite adoption, but it's like an adoptive family that happens where it's safe for them be, to be within the home. And even like the real way of Islam is like Hazrat Khatija uh, bought a slave. Who was it? Um, Zaid ibn Haritha for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a wedding gift, right? And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam already had an, a wet nurse who was the slave of his mother, and so he inherited her. But she, even though she was her, she was his property. She was like his mother, right? So she she lived with him, right? So so what happened was that the two slaves in the house of Hazrat Khatija. And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they married each other because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to the Sahaba, he said, the, anyone who wants to marry a lady from the uh, a woman from the la- from the women of uh, Jannah, marry Um Ayman, his his, his west nurse. So Zaid ibn Haratha, even though he was younger, there was a power, there was an age difference. He married her, and then they had a kid. And the kid was named Osama ibn Zaid, and you know it's said about Osama ibn Zaid that never did Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam put anyone in amriyat or uh, amriyat above above Osama ibn Zaid, even to the point where they say if Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam had been alive when they had to choose the Khalifa, he might have chosen Osama ibn Zaid. Right? No, at no point did Allah subhanahu wa taala. Put anyone above Osama ibn Zaid, so he was also one of the Ahlul Bayt, and that's one of the reasons. And this, this, because Islam is meant to build large households which unify humanity. Large households unify humanity. Broken individuals destroy humanity. Right. So we need to be organized in large households. And so what happens is, 
Osama ibn Z this adoptive this slavery is kind of like an adoption a very direct adoption into the house you become a person of the house you know and even after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam freed Zaid ibn Haratha he then became a mola to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and how Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam freed Zaid ibn Haratha in the same way because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam freed Salman 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 al Farsi, you know, uh, Salman al Farsi was also a mola of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam freed him. You know, Salman, tell me when it's time and I'll plant the the hundred trees myself, and then they give fruit the next year except for the one because Hazrat Umar wanting to uh, do the nakal of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and get the fuzzle uh, of the the ajar planted one of them so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had to replant it you know and then it gave fruit you know and so he by his labor he paid for the freedom of zaid ibn haratha so they uh, sorry of uh, salman al farsi and so salman al farsi was also a mola of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he continued to play the role of mola with hazrat ali and hazrat fatima and hazrat hasan and hazrat husain like he continued to play that role of mola because when you're a mola you're not just a mola to the father you're a mola to the family and so the the, the like so the mola of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was inherited by Fatima al Islam was inherited by Hassan al Islam was inherited like that so the freed slave who becomes a mola is is like a client it's a client of a house you know and so he remains a client for all the generations throughout his life and so do his children his children become a client household right they're a free household but they're a client household it's like leadships or leadership or allegiance in like ancient, like the vassal system you know it's resembling that type of thing um but there's no kneeling and swords and ritual around it you know there can be anyway like if if dul fazul like there's a there's the dipping your hands in the perfume like arabs did make up rituals to sanctify stuff and i don't think there's any thing wrong with doing that that's not bidda like that's not an evil thing to do something like that just that's meaningful in some intuitive way that's i don't think that's bidda um to mark an occasion or to you know celebrate something um so yeah coming back and finishing up and wrapping up um and coming back to the beginning ahle muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the only f- way for ghair ahle bayt other than ahle bayt or ghair zurriyat mustafa sallallahu alaihi wasallam ghair the descendants of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam other than the descendants the only way for someone to become ahle muhammad in the full and complete and total sense is to in literally sharran enslave themselves to um one of the ahli bayt of rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam or to or to um or to uh yeah you have to do that first and then if they free you you become a mola but unless you're willing to literally give yourself the way the mother of anas radiyanhu gave him to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam if you're not willing to give yourself in that way um the way you know the the patriarch of 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 alexandria gave uh, maria uh, Maria Kapti to Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam if unless you're willing to give yourself or to give your children to someone from Ahle Bayt ar Rasul from Zurriyat ar Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam you cannot really fully become Ahle Muhammad that is the full participation in the word Ahle Muhammad by literally enslaving yourself to their hukum and their amar putting yourself under them uh, completely and totally like becoming their slave if you don't do that then you're not ahle muhammad you you cannot be but if you do the khidma that you you are in khidma to them that is also a lesser way like the more khidma you do of ahle bayt ar rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam the more you identify that they are your sayyid and you are their slave that's the meaning of sayyid that's why if you call someone sayyid it's not just a fazul si adab you know if you don't actually mean it then you shouldn't say it so if you call them sayyid then that is what it means that you are in khidmat of them that they are your master that you you acknowledge their right to command you 
you're literally acknowledging their right to command you and that you love them and you recognize that at least in potential they have much higher potential of all the qualities and attributes of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so they have the quality and the greatness to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most at least in potential if they actualize it or not that's a different question if their taqwa is greater than yours or not that's a different question but at least potentially by birth and it is their birth right that they be supported in becoming that that their haquq be fulfilled so that they can fully and easily and gracefully be the sayyids of bani adam right that and that requires you know sharf and nobility uh, in in like the the like the sense of nobility of ancestry that requires other people to acknowledge it and to to play a corresponding role if the masses of mu'minin or and the masses of muslims and the few mu'minin don't actually fulfill the haquq of the sayyids the sharf of the sayyids if if you don't play your corresponding role then the the haqiqa of rahmatul alamin will be very limited in its expression in the present reality in the present moment of history right in the historical moment but the more the mu'minin and the muslimins do the adab of ahle muhammad fulfill their haquq make them ghani to fully devote themselves to quran and learning and teaching quran and being generous like the more you allow a sayyid to actually be noble and therefore have the leisure but not leisure in the common usage leisure in like the the asal usage that you know the old usage you allow them to have leisure with the quran you know that if you give them that then the haqiqa of rahmatul alamin will not only be a historical reality it will be a present living reality in the living alabat amongst us but there's two parts the ummah has to be willing to participate in that and the sayyids have to but the, the quality of the sayyids is when the ummah fulfills their haquq the sayyids are all, that is their nature so when we're free to be ourselves when the sayyids are free fully freed to be themselves that is when they 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 will not their freedom their na- the freedom of their nature is to express the quran and have a nazam according to the quran in the dunya and to organize all of humanity you know that is the point of being a sayyid that is the nature of being a sayyid um and so one last point here you know when the had ibrahim was made because we're close to eid al adha it is eid al adha today actually so uh, you know the reason that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, we do Eid al Adha is you know when Eid al Adha was promised to uh, to Hazrat Ibrahim when the 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 ahad was made sorry okay when the ahad was made with Ibrahim al Islam what happened was Allah commanded not only for Allah subhanahu uh, for Ibrahim to circumcise himself Ishmael Isaac his other sons but to circumcise also the male slaves of his household why because the slaves of Ibrahim's household were people who who were like Ibrahim didn't have non-muslim slaves you know he only kept good moral people in his home of course they you know for whatever reason they were slaves but they were good moral people otherwise Ibrahim didn't keep them in his home so they are a type of family they are they, and they're supposed to get married and have kids and then that is either a slave household or they're freed you know after many generations if Ibrahim is good to his his slave household and the slave household is good to you yes there is a difference in the izza there there's a sayyid and there's you know the 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 malakut or the you know the one who has who we have mulk over that is true but the, that household over generations becomes family Dif, despite the differential in izza they they become family and their izza is our izza and our izza is their izza but between us we have greater izza because we are bani ibrahim we are ahle ibrahim or we are ahle muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam right so when the ahd ibrahim was made allah commanded Allah commanded uh, Hazrat Ibrahim al Islam to circumcise the male slaves of his or the male uh, slaves of his client household because uh, they were to, by that they were to participate in the Ahad Ibrahim because they, they, they by their natures are participating through that spiritual sense. So anyone who wants to really be ahle Muhammad has to really be in the khidma of the zuriyat of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam anyone who wants to be really ahle Ibrahim needs to be in khidmat of the zuriyat of Ibrahim alaihi wasallam 
you know and this is very necessary and beyond khidma we actually this is a thing that you know um, back in, in you know people in Afghanistan people in Yemen this used to actually be a thing the way you know the mother of Anas gave Anas to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a slave to be in his khidma in the same way and that's why Anas is also Ahl bayt he's not zuriyat nabi but he is Ahl bayt he was raised in the house of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know so i would say even the family of ahle uh, of of anas and he has a huge family you know i don't know if they're around still but he had many children so even anas alayhi uh, as anas radiyanhu and i would be okay anyways anas radiyanhu for now would uh, would be ahle bayt rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam you know there's the baraka of staying in the same physical structure in which nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam is muqim for for his life as he's mawjood in it you know so <clears throat> the salam is upon those people who live in this house the way it was on the people of the house of ibrahim so uh anyways so that's that i'll make a future videos and that's all for now assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh